ています。Thank you very much. It was a, a great talk, and I, I hope that uh, we, we're going to end the talk by uh, our great friend from Portugal, uh, Alves. Uh, Alves uh, Oscar Alves has been a friend to us for many years, and he attended one of the Pan Arab uh, Fund Society meeting. I think it was. Uh, thank, thank you, so thank you so much, and apologies because I I have to leave because I have uh, surgery. So sorry. Thank you, uh, my great friend Oscar Alves. I'm so sorry for you, Oscar. Thank you so much for everybody. Thank you, thank you, and goodbye. So, uh, Oscar Alves, the treasurer for the Cervical Spine Research Society of Europe, chairman of the New Surgical Hospital, to see this Porto, Portugal. The title of his talk is Expanding the Indications of Cervical Alphaplast. Alves, Oscar, can you go ahead, please? Yeah, thank you for, for the, the invitation, uh, Dr. Yusri. It's a pleasure to be with, uh, with you again. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, presenting here quite the opposite view of Professor Guell, and I hope he apologized before this time. And while his, uh, his um, ideas don't get uh, widespread momentum, I, I would like you to do more arthroplasties and fusions. Uh, I have no uh, relevant disclosures for this presentation. And as a starting point of my lecture, I would, I would like you to discard the, the, the cost noise of arthroplasty. Uh, I think there is a, there is a problem with with the, with the cost. It's not the case in every country. For my, for example, in in Portugal, the cost of a prosthesis it's very similar uh, to a, to a cage with embedded screws. And if you look at in this survey of uh, prominent Aospine uh, international members, they acknowledge that despite the the, the reduced risk of uh, adjacent segment disease uh, and the fastest recovery, the cost was a barrier to a widespread use of, of arthroplasty. And what is the real issue about cost? Uh, the real data world from a, a large national uh, insurance database. So these are, uh, this is data from outside the IDE studies. So that there is no industry bias on this data. It shows clearly that TDR is cheaper 12% than, uh, than ACDF. And significantly lower uh, cumulative incidence of reoperation. And uh, also another paper for uh, multi-level, it shows clearly that uh, arthroplasty is a highly cost-effective procedure. Uh, so you, you consider ACDF as the gold standard and what are the facts that, that many uh, uh, biomechanics studies and finite element studies show? Fusion construct originates uh, motion loss and stiffness. And if you look at here, uh, arthroplasty and the, the, the intact segment share the similar uh, features. Also, what happened at adjacent levels? The fusion induced increase in motion is linked to a change in the center of rotation, in the location of center rotation. And uh, coupled with an increase in the discal pressure, all of these will accelerate adjacent disc degeneration. So, despite being a gold standard, ACDF, uh, it's not for me uh, a physiological operation. And what happens when you age? And you, uh, while you age, there is a tendency to increase SVA. And as you see here, by uh, increasing the SVA, there is an increase in the intradiscal pressure at the adjacent level. Even this ratio between post op and pre op uh, disc pressure will increase. Many biomechanical and in vitro studies have established that arthroplasty uh, minimizes many of these negative kinematic effects that I showed you. Uh, arthroplasty has been the most uh, scrutinized uh, uh, entity in spine surgery, multiple FDIDA tri uh, trials in the US, and they show uh, very consistent uh, results among different devices. Uh, level one evidence studies, and they all show that the overall success rate it can be superior, but it's certainly uh, not inferior. Uh, and if you pull together um, patients on, on meta-analysis, you still have the same superiority of arthroplasty. Again, here another meta-analysis with more than 5,000 patients, so a superior 
in terms of fewer uh, adjacent level reoperations, fewer index level operations. So for me, in my practice, uh, when I'm facing a single level or two level disease, for me, arthroplasty is a standard of care, and this is based on firm and unprecedented uh, evidence-based level one perspective randomized uh, data compared to uh, ACDF. And we see this with long-term follow-up. Many of those studies I showed you before, the follow-up is uh, can reach now seven to 10 years. And uh, most of these studies were done with not the so not were not done with the so-called uh, third generation uh, devices that offer six degrees of freedom uh, i believe that with this new type of devices that have three translation compressible and uh, graded resistant to angular motion the result will be probably better because they offer a more uh, physiological location of the center of rotation than this offload uh, facets and adjacent disks so we use arthroplasty uh, to preserve motion, but can arthroplasty uh, uh, resist motion? Yes. I show you a case, of a trauma case, a uh, patient with diparesis, one level disc herniation, uh, X-ray excluded major instability, uh, MRI showed no posterior band lesion, and uh, this is a fashion extension X-rays, and we look at the center of rotation, and this is what we did. Uh, and look how there was a significant decrease of the range of motion at C5-6 from 70 degrees to 9 degrees postoperatively. So there was some sort of uh, disc prosthesis uh, buffering effect that corrected for the excess of motion. This is a very selective case. Please, uh, the younger people in the audience don't start to do uh, arthroplasty in trauma cases. But this is just to show the opposite concept. Disc prosthesis can offer a greater resistance to angular motion. And this is the, the location of the center of rotation that was normal after one, one year in this patient. Another uh, unconventional case, idiopathic hyperostosis, young female with this kind of situation. Uh, this is what we did uh, with a very good result on long-term follow-up, good alignment, uh, good mobility and a good uh, location of the center of rotation of the operative disc. So whenever you have uh, minimal differences, either in clinical outcomes or, or, or even in radiological outcomes, you have to look at different uh, surrogate outcomes for, for comparing arthroplasty with ACDF. And you, of course, you look at the range of motion and you look at the quality of motion by uh, investigating this, the location of the center of rotation. And this is what of my, one of my students on his PhD uh, has done with 31 patients, different uh, environments for, for uh, this catroplasty with, with a mean follow-up of 24 months. 46 uh, processes were implanted. And we did the, the traditional flex and extension uh, evaluation of the range of motion. And using the spine view software, we uh, calculated the center of rotation. Uh, look how nicely arthroplasty can mimic uh, uh, the, the, the re relative percentage along the cervical spine. Uh, as you see here, it's almost what you see in asymptomatic adults. And there is a stability over time, as others have shown as well, uh, uh, an increase in global range of motion. and very minor changes in the range of motion of adjacent levels. And this is probably the most important data from this study. Uh, the center of rotation, uh, if you pull all of them together, uh, they tend to locate uh, superior and posterior at six months postoperatively. Uh, they only normalize at one year. That's when the center of rotation becomes in normal position compared to asymptomatic patients. And this is very important. All the all the data, the clinical data, the, the radiological data that you extract before 12 months is completely useless when you, you are assessing the, the results of your arthroplasty. Uh, if you want to validate cervical arthroplasty, you have to look at surgical balance. Surgical balance, it's important because it's related with, with pain and also leads to disease progression, uh, facet joint and adjacent disc degeneration. So it's crucial that to show what are your results with, with surgical balance. And we look at uh, uh, to, uh, 35 of, of our consecutive patients. These were the levels implanted. And there was a significant increase of the index angle 
and a non-significant increase in global angle of, of uh, lordotic angle. And the, the increase in global lordosis derives essentially from the increase at the index level lordosis. This is very important uh, data. Also, others have shown the same, the same as we shown here. Uh, this meta-analysis confirmed that arthroplasty is probably better than ACDF in global uh, cervical alignment, and also in adjacent segments, uh, is, uh, arthroplasty seems to be better than ACDF. So, uh, for me, uh, arthroplasty not only restores level uh, at the index level range of motion, it limits adjacent levels hypermobility, but uh, restores the quality of motion either at the index or adjacent levels, and there's a beneficial effect on sagittal alignment. So this is the mainstream uh, accepted indication for, for radiculopathy uh, caused by disc herniation, soft or hard, or myelopathy related with, with soft disc, but assuming a preserved disc height. And this is just to... So what, what about having this technology and start to think about expanding indications? This is what we try to do. And we, uh, we selected three cohorts of patients, those with the kyphotic index level, those with multi-levels, three and four, and those patients with collapsed disc, which means uh, more than 50% loss of disc height and a very small amount of angular motion. Uh, starting with segmental kyphosis, uh, you have this patient, uh, young patient, female, uh, with uh, important VAS uh, left arm pain, dysesthesia, uh, motor deficit. This is her uh, MRI scan on sagittal view, uh, uh, recent uh, C56 soft disc. And uh, look at how uh, there was a loss of anterior height of the disc uh, with, with uh, minus 13 degrees of angulation in neutral uh, X-ray. And this, although this was a flexible kyphosis, it was not fully reducible. Uh, still in extension, you have some negative uh, angle. So what were the causes for kyphosis? On this case, anterior muscle uh, spasm. This was not clinically visible. Uh, weakness of posterior muscles, not clinical evidence as well. Uh, loss of disc height due to disc degeneration. She was a young patient, not confirmed by the data from the MRI. Um, there was also global range of motion, so it, it was not mainly due to neck pain. And we found that this patient uh, had two years before very similar uh, neutral X ray to what I showed you. Uh, this is what we did uh, at the level arthroplasty with a uh, with, uh, gain of, of the, the, the range of motion. And uh, with the four years follow up, you see how nicely the, the segment, uh, segmental kyphosis was reversed with a, a nice uh, 5.3 uh, low doses, with a nice uh, location of the center of rotation. So we pull all, all, all our patients, we find 23 patients with segmental kyphosis, 25 kyphotic levels operated. These were the distribution of the operated levels. And there was a statistically significant increase in segmental low doses at kyphotic levels. All patients had an improvement. And uh, this is quite different from what Kim showed in, on his paper, that only 13% of pre-op index level kyphotic became lordotic. Once again, these were completely different type of devices. Uh, Non-significant increase in C2-C7 angle, uh, non-significant reduction on SVA. So <clears throat> patients with pre-op kyphosis, uh, they tend to have lower T1 slope. And this is the key, a lower preoperative T1 slope is generally associated with large change in segmental angle. And this is helpful to restore uh, sagittal alignment in patients with kyphosis. Of course, in some patients, you can do uh, some technical tip and, uh, and uh, you can do a posterior wedge shape and plate drilling uh, in, in, to reformat the disc space in a, in a lordotic configuration. And of course, very important is to do uh, neck uh, strengthening, uh, building exercises with, with muscles in the long term. So segmental kyphosis, which is associated with narrowing of neuroforamen, it's not a problem. You can decompress and you can use uh, an atroplasty that does not compromise the compression of nerve root and will allow you a nice uh, um, reconstruction of, of uh, segmental lordosis. 
preserving the, the range and the quality of motion. Of course, you have to face uh, reducible uh, segmental kinesis. So what about the multi-level, more than two levels? Uh, when I start to do uh, in large scale uh, arthroplasty, I also always interested in, in multi-level patients. And uh, uh, these are the ones, if you do a fusion, they will have a significant impact in the cervical spine global uh, function status. Uh, cervical spine was made for motion, and this, this gave us uh, an important phylogenetic advantage. And something that I see more and more in my practice is multi-level disc disease uh, in young patients, patients that have higher life expectancy. Certainly, if you do this kind of fusion, you end up having uh, adjacent segment disease. Of course, this is adjacent segment disease not only due to, uh, uh, to, to fusion or to multi-level fusion. There is also uh, uh, on, on factors of the patient that can favor adjacent segment disease. But there are consistent uh, reports that show a reduction of uh, adjacent segment disease after arthroplasty. If you do multi-level arthroplasty, it only amplifies the loss of motion and decreasing stiffness compared with single-level fusion. You induce also a significant increase in hypermobility. Um, and once again, showing you this graph, uh, an increase in disc uh, pressure uh, loads. This is, as I told you, these young patients with multi-level symptomatic disc disease, uh, you have to be careful when you fuse, you fuse them on, on multi-level. Uh, if you look at uh, with, with the, the increasing of the SVA, that's something that happens with aging. There is an hyperextension of uh, C0-C1 and the compensatory flexion of uh, C2 to C7. And if you block these mechanisms of uh, uh, recruitment by performing a fusion, you can run uh, in troubles later in life. Okay, I think I have a problem here. I'm sorry. Did you fall off? <clears throat> Andreas, you okay? With this, uh, yes. Insert the third on. No voice. I, I think we lost the connection with Oscar Elvis, and I think he will oh. sign. He will sign mm -hmm. in again. Till okay. He, uh, till he is signing in, we can uh, open the floor for discussion with uh, Andreas and the Professor uh, Atul. Doctor Atul is here. Can I speak to him? So, any questions for Andres? I want to discuss Dr. Atol if he's here. He's not here. I cannot. Okay. Uh, Andres, may I ask you for uh, for most of your cases? Uh, for me, when I have a patient with Coda Equina syndrome and uh, with weakness in the lower limb, actually, I prefer to go for fusion remove the disc, remove everything, give him the best chance to recover from his uh, neurological state. Is it the same in your hand or you're still doing discectomy as decompression for such cases, even with Coda Equina syndrome? So, so you're following Professor Goel's advice to fuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, to be honest, in, in our cases, it, it's usually a disc problem. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's two things. It's either a fresh disc in the majority of cases, so we do a microdiscectomy or a sequestrectomy. In other words, only the sequester is removed. Uh, and of course, in some cases, we have an acute on chronic uh, compression where there is already uh, ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, lateral resistenosis, and on top of that, the disc makes the, the final blow. So in those cases, we would do a, I personally would do a, you know, a, a laminotomy, discectomy. Okay. Uh, yeah, but 
it's rare. If, I have to be honest, it's very rare for someone to present with instability related acute compression. Okay. So Oscar is uh, back, so we can continue. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened here. Katab, I'm sorry. So I was telling you about this, this, uh, this um, compensatory mechanisms. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Oscar, please go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. So uh, also when you do a multi-level HDF, besides uh, ampering these compensatory mechanisms, you have all the sort of adverse effects that I'm not going too much through this, but you had hardware failure, you have pseudoarthrosis, you have suicidal, and all this is, is uh, in direct co correlation between the number of fused levels and the incidence of, of, uh, of complications. Uh, this I'm, I'm showing you again this uh, this uh, uh, slide with the outcomes, and if you look at here, it seems that the more levels you do, comparing two levels with single level, the better outcomes you do. And this is something that it's really apparent from my practice uh, that uh, multi-level patients are really satisfied with the multi-level arthroplasty. Um, in terms of range of motion, it doesn't matter if you do a single level or a multi-level, the, the disc prosthesis will function uh, equally and will add the, 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 the kinematic effect. And multi-level implants also, also show similar improvements uh, compared to single level in terms of sagittal alignment. So you don't, no, don't lose any of the properties of the disc prosthesis by doing multi-level. And this is something that we show also in the paper that we published uh, last year in Journal of Spine Surgery, our, our uh, cohort of patients with multi-levels. Uh, we had no cases of migration, no cases of subsidence, and, and uh, ethotopic calcification we reported to be less than 8%. And as you see here, a good, good sagittal alignment in multi-level patients. And really no difference if we, if you do three versus uh, three and four levels versus two level. Uh, basically, a paper here showing that the more levels you do, uh, the best uh, results you can have either clinically or reducing the rate of your operation. So this is really the kind of patients I see a lot in my in my practice today uh, with with rather young patients with uh, with four level disc disease, symptomatic myelopathic patients. And this is what, what I offer to the patient with, uh, with long-term follow-up. Another patient, and this is in a book that we'll be publishing soon. Uh, this is 45 years old female, again, symptomatic radiculopathy, some elements of uh, myelopathy. And this is really a nice, uh, nice uh, solution for the, for the patient. So trying to expand further the indications, what about the, the collapse needs? Those with... The, uh, loss than more than 50% of disc height and uh, loss of angular motion. Uh, we are talking here about discs of less than three millimeters high. Um, when you have uh, when you have uh, multi-level disc disease, you have uh, uh, discs with different stages of progression of, of the disease. And of course, uh, multi-level hybrid constructs can be a very good option. You, you can do in the more spondylotic levels, the, the, the ACDF, and the more uh, safe levels, the, or more normal levels, the, the arthroplasty. Uh, this is actually one of, uh, one of the interesting patients that we did. I had done a, a, an ACDF in 2014 to this patient, and look how, uh, I, I, I could show you the MRI, but it's not here, how she developed a two-level disc disease, adjacent level. And look how small, uh, how almost uh, spondylotic, non-mobile uh, this level. And we offered her a two-level um, arthroplasty. And look the evolution uh, how, how, how over the years, at one year, at, uh, at uh, four years, how she became more balanced, uh, more lordotic with with time. Uh, it would not be the case, I'm sure, if I would offer a uh, two-level fusion to, to solve her problem. Uh, another interesting case I want to show you, uh, share with you, another young female, uh, three months progressive neck pain, left arm pain, and Joe 14, let me sign, dysesthesia, uh, weakness, grade four, minus four. This is her MRI scan, three-level compressive disc disease uh, on a myeloradiculopathy patient. Um, 
patient has a very, very almost straight patient, 1.8 degrees. Uh, as you see here, loss of this item in range of motion in C4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 7 with uh, the disc height in 4.6 less than, uh, than 3 millimeters. So this was a challenge for us. Uh, Multi-level disc uh, disease in a young patient with uh, radicular myelopathy and balanced C-spine, uh, spondylosis with lo loss of disc height and uh, residual motion at the index level. How to solve the case? This is what we did, uh, arthroplasty. And this is what we get uh, 48 months postoperatively with nice uh, motion in extension, in flexion. And we got a more balanced uh, patient with uh, better low doses, almost 20 degrees recovery of low dose uh, with, with a good, uh, with a decrease in SVA. As you see here, look how. Uh, the levels that were almost uh, non-mobile recover uh, the disc uh, the disc movement and look how we managed to increase the disc height uh, from less than three millimeters to 6.6 .6 millimeters in, the, in this case. And 48 months asymptomatic uh, patient uh, decompression was not compromised by arthroplasty. This is another patient, uh, high-ranking public administration official, that we have done also uh, three-level arthroplasty and look again how uh, these slit discs were increased in height. This is the kind of uh, leverage maneuver that I do at the end of the operation to assess if it, it is suitable or not to insert a, a disc prosthesis, and if I, I, I acknowledge a certain degree of movement, uh, I'll certainly save the patient to a fusion and insert a, a disc prosthesis. We look at, at the results of our 28 patients, uh, 39 levels operated on, on collapsed discs, and look here how uh, they increased the, 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 the mean disc height and the index level range of motion was quite important. This is in line with a study, the only other study that I know in the literature, public, published by Pat Worden in, in Spine 2016, uh, that collapsed discs were distracted two times, uh, more than two times over the pre-op height. And this is done with uh, eight patients. So uh, it's possible to, to, to distract uh, collapsed discs with substantial increase in post-op range of motion and quality of motion. We have done uh, center of rotation evaluation on, on some of those patients. Uh, it was interesting to see that more collapsed discs show the higher increase in disc height, and more collapsed discs also show the higher uh, range of motion uh, improvement. So I think, in a way, if you use compressible disc prosthesis, they are this kind of situation is amenable to arthroplasty. Of course, uh, severe spondylosis with bridging osteophytes facet arthrosis, osteoporosis, stability, uh, rigid kyphosis remain a contraindication for, for arthroplasty. And basically that's what I'm showing here, facet transfer generates modic changes, lar large osteophytes, diffuse OPLL ankylosis. So there is still an important uh, uh, number of contraindications for arthroplasty. Uh, we need also in the future better uh, or implant design, as you see here, uh, the, the location of distant center of rotation uh, varies from one disc level to another one, from C2, C3 to C6, C7. So we need more custom-made uh, implants. Uh, we are probably not far away from this. Also, while you're aging, uh, the center of rotation tends to be uh, located more anterior and, and higher in patients older than 50. So we really need uh, uh, new devices adapt to the, to the age of the patient, to the pathology, and to the level that you are operating. I thank you for, for the invitation. It was really a great honor. And um, I invite you to, to, to join us at our annual meeting at CSRS Europe uh, at the end of September in Paris. Thank you. And sorry for this little problem. <laughs> Thank you very much, Oscar. Great talk. Uh, can I ask, do you do hybrid? Do you combine fusion with uh, 
arthroplasty. And if you do so, how do you choose which is which? Right. Uh, certainly, uh, fusion, it's, uh, hybrid constructs, it's, it's a good option. In a way, you can have the best of both worlds. Uh, so what I tend to do is in the more spondylotic level, the more closed level uh, or slit level, I, I tend to do the fusion and arthroplasty on, on the other situation. Another, another issue is hypermobility. If you have a segment with a very unstable, even though the disc can be preserved, you're not offering arthroplasty, you should do a fusion. Uh, also, you have to acknowledge that there are segments that are more mobile than others. Uh, in, in five, six, I tend to do more arthroplasties. In six, seven, uh, less mobile segment. Even in, in asymptomatic patients, I tend to, if possible, we can, or if necessary, I don't regret to do a fusion. Thank you very much. Mohammed, do you have uh, other? Yes, may, may, I, may I open uh, the discussion between the speakers? Uh, if Andres want to highlight some, some points regarding uh, Oscar talk uh, for, for our bad luck that uh, Dr. Atul, I think he uh, left the meeting because it is too late at night in his country and uh, Soriano has uh, uh, surgery. So, Andres, would you like to comment on Oscar talk and then Oscar can comment on Andres talk and even both of you can tell us some points regarding Dr. Atul. It is a really debatable talk. Andres, Thank may we start with you? Yes. Thank you very much, Osame. Uh, I liked uh, Oscar's talk. Uh, it gives good evidence. It reviews the evidence. There's plenty of meta-analysis. We have done one ourselves here a couple of years ago, and I agree that there is very good evidence that the aims of arthroplasty are achieved. Uh, namely, number one, motion preservation, which is clearly uh, achievable because of the design. Uh, and secondly, adjacent segment disease is also uh, achieved, although there is still the debate whether that is uh, a biological phenomenon uh, rather than uh, the fusion phenomenon. So the, the uh, other good thing about Oscar's talk is the expanded indications because the majority of surgeons will do one or two level arthroplasties because that is what the randomized control trial data support. Uh, and there is very good evidence. In fact, there is better evidence for two levels cervical arthroplasty than one level. Um, and we also now have long-term, medium to long-term data with the updated results from the trials reaching now more than 10 years. The expanded indications are interesting because Oscar has shown us uh, that he has restored lordosis. He has shown us that he's used it in myelopathic patients. Uh, and he's also shown us more than three level surgery, which um, is not that common. I only had one question, which uh, I think uh, has already been answered into as to which which is the ideal patient for a hybrid and which is the ideal patient for, for a two-level uh, disc arthroplasty. Um, but I guess that was partly answered. So well done. I enjoyed that. Thank you, Thank you so much for your, your comments. I, I really appreciate it. I mean, agent segment disease, it's really, it's really a box where you can put everything. Uh, so the, the incidence, it really depends on your definition of adjacent segment disease. If you take uh, reoperation uh, as, as an index, it's one thing. If you look at radiology, it's another thing. Uh, and, and also, of course, there is a bias in, in, the, in, in many, many papers because surgeons that believe arthroplasty is the best uh, operation don't don't report adjacent segment disease the same do patients if patients are convinced they have done a great operation they don't report uh, adjacent segment disease or they, they 
they don't come to, to doctors. I mean, one thing I can tell you, it's, I tend to follow my patients over time. And uh, I see patients, you know, operated a long time ago. And it's frequent to have to reoperate fusion patients adjacent level. They come with, with symptoms. I can't remember of a patient that I did arthroplasty to reoperate uh, um, an adjacent segment. And the patients really don't come. Yeah, I mean, it's not me that select the ones I want to operate or not. It's just, they, they, they really don't come to with complaints. So this is not scientific, but it tells you the feeling of, of the situation. Uh, Oscar, may I ask you regarding the arthroplasty at T67 and T7, T1, because actually these two levels in particular are nearly immobile. So I will prefer to fuse these two levels in particular, whatever the pathology, and maybe I will do uh, arthroplasty for soft the death causing a myelopathy, if I'd like to extend, expand the indication, as you said, for some uh, uh, degenerative disc disease with the healthy facets, uh, as you showed us. What, what do you think about that? Uh, I mean, I, I think you were right. I mean, if, if, your, if your main indication is motion preservation, you have to understand and to know what, what are the most mobile levels in cervical spine. And uh, it's... it's Perfect. I, I perfectly agree with you. I mean, those levels are less mobile, so you can do you can do a fusion, but you have to understand that you are transferring biomechanical load to, to superior level. Uh, I've done very few C71. Uh, I can remember a couple of them or a handful of them, and these were young patients, and I believe one of the mechanisms for the, the developing a uh, this herniation was also some sort of hypermobility. So these levels were really mobile. So I wanted to protect and, and, and regain mobility and I, I end up doing, and it was, it went very well. I, I think Andres mentioned the multi-levels. Of course, these are very exceptional cases. It's not everyday case, uh, but I, people should not, if you have to do it and there is a clear indication, you should not be afraid of, of uh, migration or whatever, because the, the primary stability of those implants are, 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 it's really safe. That's at least what I can, I can say. Great. So may I ask Dr. Uh, Pat to uh, unmute himself and ask the question? Dr. Pat? Okay, Dr. Ahmed Marziban, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, okay, thanks a lot, um, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Yusri, and all the panelists for this uh, nice event. Um, actually, my questions were um, all directed to Dr. Atul, but uh, since he's not available, I'd like to discuss it with um, all uh, the speakers. Um, and um, especially, we ended by the talk of Dr. Elvis, um, introducing or stressing on the principle of motion preservation. Uh, my first question, if um, the idea of Dr. Atul is a stabilization, then ACDF uh, would do uh, the job in addition to uh, doing proper decompression and restoring kyphos. Uh, the second question is that um, in many cases of Dr. Atul, he did this technique in kyphotic cervical spine. Uh, and even in some cases, uh, cervical kyphosis was exaggerated post-operative, which um, theoretically at least uh, would increase uh, the, the process, the ongoing. Um, finally, in the lumbar spine, uh, there are many papers which are uh, presenting um, the effectiveness of decompression alone in cases of a degenerative spondylolisthesis, which is contradictory to the uh, theory of stabilization by Dr. Atul. So these are my three questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Oscar, can you, can, you, can you comment? Yeah, I can comment, but very briefly, I would like to say that uh, 
just before that, that I, I really enjoyed uh, Andrea's uh, presentation. Uh, I think this is kind of not good. Uh, I think this is the kind of work that we we need, you know, to 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 look at uh, either to to preserve our activity and and uh, understand. And uh, so I really like your 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 presentation, Andres. And uh, we have to do some work about this, and not only about surgery and 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 techniques and everything. So I really congratulate you for, for it. it. It increased our knowledge on how to deal with patients. And uh, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, to meet patient expectations. So I, I really enjoy your lecture. Thank you. I mean, co considering uh, uh, the questions, <laughs> Dr. Gould, uh, ideas, you know, I, I think it's it's not very nice to talk here once uh, Atul is not here. And uh, But anyway, I. I I acknowledge that he has some uh, points on what we say. You know, if you, for example, if you look at the panels in C1, C2, it completely disappears if you do a stabilization. And we have also this this, this experience in patients that uh, with spondylotic myelopathy with anterior compression that we 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 fix from the from posterior laminectomy and and lateral mass fusion, and we saw as you know, sometimes can happen in two, three months, completely disappearance of the anterior compression, even in, in low level of the, of the cervical spine. So I think Professor Gould is a bright surgeon, he's a bright person and, and a scientific person. And I can acknowledge that he has some points on what he says. Um, and I mean, this was, in reality, this is not new. If you look at the works of uh, Matsunaga in 76, he already showed that most of the patients that were uh, with a canal compromise were not myelopathic, you know. And the most myelopathic patients were the ones who had compression plus hypermobility, okay? So this was really clear from the 76, from those uh, landmark papers. So it makes sense to think that if you stop motion, you can you can you can avoid progression of myelopathy. For me, it makes some sense what you say. Another thing is, if you're going to apply this to every patient, to critically myelopathic patients, I would not tend to do that. I think those patients, as is shown in this presentation, uh, some of them deserve decompression and and need decompression to to for an improvement. So so uh, I I will. Uh finalize your your questions ahmed that you can visit dr atul he sent the invitation for all of us to visit his center and see his techniques and see his philosophy after of course the uh the way so the final question from the my question Hello, so my question is an extension to the previous three questions. Uh, yes, they are directed to Dr. Atul only. He, uh, sir, in idiopathic scoliosis, adult idiopathic scoliosis, is there any subtle instability at cervical junction also? Any any finding that we find a subtle instability in the cervical junction in adult idiopathic scoliosis? Well, I, I can't comment on that. I, I have no, I have no, I, have, I haven't seen this phenomena. But uh, you know, I, I have to accept if Dr. Goel speaks so. I, you know, I, we have to to, to take it. Uh, sure. But personally, I, I, you know, we know that there are compensations between uh, C0, C2, and C2, C7. Um, even uh, even in, in in flexion extension, in in lateral bending. Uh, we see it all the time, and generally it goes on the opposite way. But uh, assuming an instability uh, up, uh, at the cranial vertebral junction linked to a, to a scoliosis, you know, I, I, I really haven't seen this phenomena. But, you know, coming from Dr. Google, I, I understand that he, he has a huge experience, so I, I think it would be possible to, to exist. Thank you. So, Dr. Omar Hamoud.
So there is no more questions or comments. Sorry, may I ask a question, please? It, I had posted it. Sorry if you had announced my name earlier. Question is to Professor Elvis. What is his choice of device in the disc arthroplasty? And if there is a question about post-op artifact in MRI scan, what is the solution? Thank you. Okay, uh, I mean, starting from the last question, I think uh, you saw one of the, my patients, I showed an MRI uh, and with the kind of device that I used, there was very little artifact. You can still uh, see very well if there is cord compression on, and nerve compression. And certainly, I mean, uh, the device I'm using are, are so-called third generation device. It, it can be said it's the, the M6. I have no financial interest. Uh, it's a compressible device. Uh, it has some degree of uh, anterior translation while you do flexion. And that's among the devices, the one I see with a better reproduction of the center of rotation of, of the disc. Uh, the, uh, those, that study that I showed you uh, presented a normal center of rotation on, or a good location at the end of one year of the, of the follow-up of the patient. So, but you probably need for, for patients that are more mobile, older implants can be used that are constrained. They will offer better, better, better control of motion. So there is no recipe, but I think uh, devices uh, of the third generation that they have compression and six degrees of motion, and they have a superior biomechanical, biomechanical biokinematical profile. Uh, the other thing is I don't like uh, implants with keels. Uh, they don't add to primary stability at all, and they are related with a lot of heterotopic calcification. Uh, so I would not advise them to, to use uh, implants with big keels. They completely destroy the, the, the end plate, and we, it will induce a high level of, of uh, heterotopic calcification, at least that we see reported in, in papers with all the implants. Thank you. Thank you for those answers and excellent webinars and congratulations to all the four speakers and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So for, for the speakers and the panelists and the moderator, if, if there is any comment or something to say, if no... I think, I, I think I'm going to have dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Ramadan here. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we finished the, the iftar okay. very rapidly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all. And it was a pleasure to being here, really. Great. I, I, I love you guys from Egypt. Uh, uh, we have time. We have time. No time. You, you would like to comment, please? Uh, I, I asked Dr. Oscar about the extraction of the extension about the uh, for uh, cervical column. Uh, always there is a vertebrate. We see about the uh, distraction is too much, or uh, if, if there is a uh, prolapse, disc prolapse of cervical disc, okay? Multiple cervical disc. Make distraction every level or not? Uh, not distinct distraction. Sorry, I couldn't understand your, your question, please. If we have multi disc prolapse of cervical, okay? Yes. Hey. We make uh, distraction for the nerve, nerve root, okay? Distraction, okay? We make cage. Uh, okay, every... I got your question now, yes. yes. Or okay. not. How can we make distraction? Every level? Okay, I mean, okay. the thing is, when, 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 you do a, when you do an ACDS, you rely a lot on indirect decompression uh, to gain disc height and to gain foramen and height. So, you, you know, it's a very forgiven uh, surgery, ACDF. If you do arthroplasty, uh, you have to be more careful. You have to, be, you have to do more foraminal decompression, probably yes. go beyond the, 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 the pathology in order to not compromise, to not impede the nerve root in the extremes of range of motion that you preserve. Yes. So, uh, there are technical tips that you should follow uh, when you do an arthroplasty. You probably have to do more uh, foraminal decompression, uncus uh, release, 
you know, in order to be safe and to not have a recurrence of, uh, of pain. And if you do so, it's not a problem. It's not a problem and you don't need the, the indirect compression that ACDF affords you. Okay. I'm no, I don't know if you are clear, but you know, if you do bilateral uh, foraminotomy, you increase um, angular motion by 0.4 degrees. And you don't, you don't uh, affect much anterior uh, posterior translation. Also, if there is a posterior stenosis of the cervical column and uh, multiple prolapse, maybe disc and uh, cages, okay? Uh, we make posterior also or not? Yes, or I've, seen I've, I've, I've seen that. I've seen stretching the, 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 the ligamental flavum uh, uh, impingement with, with, uh, with, uh, with arthroplasty. Of course, I mean, that is not a problem. There is also a ligamental tax effect. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, speakers, Dr. Oscar Alves, Dr. Andreas, for staying with us till now. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Atul Boyle as well and uh, Dr. Soriano for their participation and uh, Professor Wilson Hawari for uh, moderating his testimony. And of course, my greetings to uh, John Pennett and the Neurosurgical TV and Dr. Samah El Morsi for his great efforts. And thank you all and see you in the next uh, events for the Egyptian and World Neurosurgery Community Academy. See you in thank, you thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.